Hello, hello, and welcome to another Hometown Daily News Show. This is for January 28th, 2023. Normally, there's a preamble right here where I'll tell you about a rundown of the articles, but tonight's the night of the comment. So we're going to get right into the news. Hello, everybody. And uh, today is... Well, it's going to be interesting because normally what happens is there is a a multitude of news sources, but I'm going to come out right out and say that we've pretty much have a a single news source dominating the news today because everybody else is focused on other things. um, And uh, we're not going to focus on that um, because I I think that there's uh, more important voices talking about it. Uh, but I'm going to stick, and we, I should say, are going to stick to um, the news that is uh, more focused on um, business and technology with smatterings of society, but with the focus on de- definitively on the technological and business side of it. Um, so um, obviously this issue in society needs to be addressed, um, but it, here is not the time, now is not the place. Flip that, reverse it, and now you'll be correct (laughs) that said i am mayor watt that is omtown.com and the voice from on high the ai that runs everything in omtown except for my speech patterns good evening omtown citizens and maybe we can plug that module in to work on the speech patterns (laughs) oh god we'll never get through the show uh, so again, welcome to hometown daily news show. Um, we've already selected a bunch of articles, but this pattern, uh, today, it, it's really shocking, um, how this all shook out because we did not select these articles based on a particular news source. It just happens to dominate, um, all of the, uh, news today. Um, so let's get right into it. The very first article is that a group of students built a robotic hand for a 15 year old classmate who said the device changed his life. I think that's pretty amazing and definitely merges this whole business technology and society concept that is hometown and hometown daily news. Um, classmates of a Tennessee student, Sergio Peralta, um, who's 15, uh, built him a robotic hand says uh, CBS news. Obviously this was aggregated from CBS news reporting, but we aggregated it from business insider. Um, you'll hear that refrain again and again. Um, so we think that this is really special. Uh, I in particular, because one of my first passions was cybernetics, um, but more focused on the, um, cyber technology from role-playing games and that is what i was really interested in getting to the point where we could fuse uh, and the phrase is meat and machine instead of how we do it still to this very day where you basically if you uh, lose a limb then you have what remains of your limb and then a mechanical augmentation is suction cupped onto your body essentially or back in the day it was more even uh, a strap than uh, like a little suction cup we've gotten more efficient and effective in applying the augmentation but it isn't a direct um, like titanium arm mounted directly into the the um, patient's bone and skin grafting and things like that um it it still is what it is and it's still hundreds of thousands of dollars for the better equipped augmentations right so a 15 year old student who was born with a hand that didn't fully form received a life-changing prosthetic from his fellow pupils let's just go over to the source and Sam Tabaridi or Tabaridi um, is the author of this over at Business Insider. And um, this is not the picture. They actually make that exclamation in the um, article itself over at businessinsider.com. This is a Getty image. Um, so 
I'm really curious what they actually did. The, the prosthetic that the engineering students created changed his life, says Peralta. Um, and I hope that they have an actual picture of it. Um, they say here that he felt like hiding his arm in his sleeve. However, Jeff Wilkins, a teacher at the school, found that about uh, Peralta's hand and assigned his students the task of building him a robotic one. Um, first off, I think it's a shame that um, they felt that they needed to hide their hand. Uh, but that is an, th that's the nature of society, it seems, particularly for high school kids, where anything, anything that can be, depending on, you know, the, the uh, culture, the society at large, if they feel like they can exploit that weakness, perceived weakness, um, and just slam somebody, the, some kids just do it. And I think that's horrible. Um, but thankfully, you know, maybe this will change that direction. Now they're a cyborg. Um, they never expected it. Like never in a million years, they said, um, Bob Cotter, the school principal, uh, told BBC news, a CBS partner that the class that led to the hands creation, uh, was designed to take the theoretical and turn it into reality. So pure technology application, knowledge, skills, and abilities turned into a reality and it changes people's lives. This is what society should be doing and, and not fighting and, and not exploiting weakness in, uh, you know, perceived weakness, because this, even the, what they're, what the uh, student felt was something that should be hidden didn't change who they really are, you know, re really deep down inside. It didn't change who they were. Um, but some people are just kind of bullies when they see something like that and they want, they, they want to exploit it. So, um, thankfully these engineering students put something together and designed a prosthetic using online software and 3d printing techniques. Um, there actually is quite a movement out there. Um, what do you think about this AI? I think it's absolutely amazing. And this is the kind of thing that technology should be used for. See a problem and solve it. Yeah, so there's actually a, a whole movement out there uh, designed to uh, facilitate 3D modeling of uh, what I would refer to as cybernetic limbs, augmentations. Um, and they 3d print them in their home. They just get the design specs. Um, like we can do that here in hometown. We can 3d print in this, um, fashion for other people. Um, and sometimes they get custom, uh, designs. And as the, uh, recipient of the limb grows up, they 3d print another one. They get the other one back if they even bother to, because it's really inexpensive to 3d print. Um, but if you go somewhere else and try and if you do this through insurance, if you do this through some business, it's wildly expensive. Um, but there are countless people out there now that are supporting this effort. And I wish I would have been better prepared uh, to link, make a link and put this um, in uh, everybody's uh, worldview. But you can do a Google search for this right now. Um, just do um, uh a search for 3d printed, uh, limbs for, um, you know, patients, and you'll end up getting a, a list of, um, sites pretty, pretty simple. Um, and something that I tell people all the time, you know, if you get an idea of something, if you have a question, don't wait for somebody to answer it. Just do a Google search, uh, empower yourself to find your information. Um, that said, let's go on to the next article and if we can come up with a, a link in the meantime, um, we'll do so and, and we'll throw it into the VOD and, or, and, or into the show notes. Uh, we can always come back to it. Um, oh yeah. So NIH, uh, thank you. Uh, the AI from on high, um, notified me that 3d printable prosthetics from NIH 3d print exchange. All you have to do is go to 3d print.nih.gov and, um, that'll provide you some information. Um, a little bit of volunteerism, even in your local community will change people's lives. Um, 
So let's go on to the next article. Uh, this one's in the Hatch Ideas channel. 10 things about ancient Egypt that movies and TV got wrong, according to an expert. Um, this is in Hatch Ideas because of the source that it comes from, but it really should be over in Continuity Report. Um, movies and television shape what people think about ancient Egypt, but they often get the basics wrong from cruel pharaohs to booby trapped pyramids. Here are 10 things that Moon Knight, the mummy and others got wrong. And one thing that they got right. I will not go through all 10 of them. I want to just introduce you to this show or to this article, to the, uh, writers and to this website. Um, but I, I'll find something that I think is interesting in here. Uh, one of my first passions along with the cybernetics side of things was, um, archeology. span I was always fascinated um, with ancient Egypt. Um, and now everything is aliens. So, um, the pyramids were built by aliens, right? Anyway, now I'll just leave that alone. Uh, Marion, I think is Gwino and uh, Carter Fallon, um, are the authors of this over at business insider. And, um, so let's, let's run down through this really quick. Uh, like I said, I won't go through all of them. They talk about the 10 commandments and Cleopatra Raiders of the lost Ark. You mean Raiders of the lost Ark wasn't a documentary. I mean, it seemed hyper realistic. I don't know what they're talking about. Like idiocracy really was that one really is a, a documentary from the future. Um, but maybe not that a normal explorer could not casually remove the lid of a sarcophagus. No. Um, I, I guess in the movies, they do this just to expedite the storyline. Right. Um, because yeah, it wouldn't be interesting if we had to watch for a month while they used heavy <laughs> equipment or whatever <laughs> and explosives. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they damaged a lot of stuff trying to open up these stone sarcophagi. Uh, men and women wore coal eyeliner. So Elizabeth Taylor rocks audiences uh, with her portrayal of Cleopatra in 1963 and her character wore intricate eyeliner traced all the way through her temples uh, and it became iconic. I guess they didn't do that kind of stuff. I'm going to jump through here, a lot of this stuff. Figurines buried with the uh, deceased would not have been found in the sarcophagus. Yeah, found around them. I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff that would have been found around them. Uh, tombs would have been well-preserved and colorful. The one Raiders of the Lost Ark got right. Um, uh, yes and no. Uh, based on my understanding, uh, it really depends on the age of the uh, tomb. Um, and um, so, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's a, a lot of talk about what was vibrant and what wasn't um and if it had been breached at some point of course so when indiana jones enters the tomb of the raiders of the lost ark that's exactly what the tomb looks like except for the snakes why did it have to be snakes um i don't think that there's a lost ark somewhere hidden in ancient egypt that's going to wipe out the nazis um Damn it. Um, I guess that's number 11. There you go. That and there is a time machine somewhere in one of the pyramids that will allow me to go back a couple of years and slap the bad bat out of somebody's mouth. Anyway, go over to this link at um, Business Insider. All roads flow through hometown and we'll connect you right to this one. Now, uh, this next article is um over in the hatch ideas channel again it's because it's from uh, business insider we have quite a few articles uh, but i will just point you right over to them um, and, and not really go through it verbatim uh, we could be the last humans to see the green comet passing earth for some time uh, for the first time since the ice age the last time till the next time and here's how where and when to watch it by the way in 1984, there was a movie called The Night of the Comet, which basically killed off all of the humans, um, except for, I think, everybody who was young. Uh, it was a comedy horror film written and directed by Tom Eberhardt, and it stars uh, Catherine Mary Stewart, 
Robert Beltran, Kelly Marooney as survivors of a comet that has turned most people into either dust or zombies. So 1984 zombie movie, Night of the Comet. And tonight's the night of the comet. It's not. Um, so astronomers recently discovered a green comet approaching Earth for the first time in 50,000 years. Um, it 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 is the harbinger of the end of the universe, right? Is, isn't that what? No, do I have it wrong? I think so, because then we would have already had the end of the universe. Oh, because of the 50,000 years ago. Right, 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 right. Well, maybe it actually is a reset. It's uh, I'm I'm now starting that as a myth that might actually become a whole thing on the Internet. Right. Let's see. Uh, so here's how, where and when to see Comet ZTF, which even that sounds like doom and gloom, right? Comet. It does. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, as it passes Earth in late January and early February, and uh, it'll be near Polaris, the bright North Star at the tip of the Little Dipper. My gosh, it's just getting more and more just creepy, right? So around January 30th, if you ever have anything that should stir creative juices for world building and writing, this could probably be, you know, Night of the Comet uh, Part 2 or, you know, Revisit It or whatever you want to call it. And the Z in ZTF stands for zombies. Um, I was thinking zero or something because of the reset. Oh, yeah, really? So this article is over again at businessinsider.com. Morgan McFall Jensen, Johnson and Kenneth Neymar. Neymar um, wrote this article and I think Comet ZTF imaged on December 19th, 2022 uh, by Dan Bartlett. Um, this, I imagine they're going to talk that this is a, a copper metal alloy kind of comet and it's giving this off, I suppose, if it's greenish. Um, astronomers recently discovered this green comet approaching Earth for the first time in 50,000 years. I, I'm curious why they know that it's 50,000 years. That's um, a good point, because we didn't have the Internet or anything 50,000 years ago. So where do they have records of it? And it's not like we were writing stuff down 50,000 years ago. Right. So, uh, people were spitting dye over their hands 50,000 years ago in French caves. I don't think that they had green dye where they're sitting there telling, uh, oh, well, there's a comet that comes around every 50,000 years. Anyway, I love the name of this place. C slash 2022 E3 ZTF or Comet ZTF, which is short for the name of uh, the astronomers that gave this space snowball after the Zwicky Transient Facility discovered it in March hasn't been in our cosmic neighborhood since the last ice age. Um, and uh, researchers calculated that the icy, icy ball of gas, dust, and rock orbits the sun roughly over, um, it says ever, uh, but typo, I suppose, over 50,000 years, which means the Neanderthals, um, or, uh, no, the, <laughs> I was going to make a joke about how sometimes I feel like I'm talking to some Neanderthals. Um, we're still walking the earth and humans had just migrated out of Africa. What do you think? Do you think this portends the end of, uh, or the start of an ice age? Um, no, I don't think it'll be the start of an ice age. Maybe this will set the timelines like we talk about <laughs> in some of the other episodes. <laughs> So a completely shaded new moon uh, provided ideal dark skies for spying the comet on January 21st. It's supposed to be visible on the 30th. If you miss that, uh, your last best chance to see the comet in the northern hemisphere is on and around Monday, January 30th, when ZTF will be between the end of the Big Dipper and Polaris, the North Star. Uh, then... In early February, the comet will be visible in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, hopefully um, those of us who are in Ohm Town will be able to um, look outside and see this. 
Uh, uh, Comet ZTF will pass about 26 million miles from Earth, the closest that it'll get on February 2nd. That's nearly 109 times the average distance of the moon, but the comet is burning so bright that it could still be visible in the night sky. I am really curious um not really to spot it because you'll probably you could probably download um apps um either on android or on ios um the apple store where you can track comet ztf um in the in the heavens from wherever you are even if it's on the opposite side of the earth all you have to do is hold the app and move it around and it shows you wherever it might be so that you can be prepared for it in the future. Um, but it says comets are notoriously unpredictable, but it, if this one continues its current trend in brightness, it'll be easy to spot with binoculars and it's just possible that it'll become visible to the unaided eye under dark skies. So maybe um, you'll be able to see it and you can look at uh, look to the right stars to see the green comet according to earthsky.org, which will probably show you exactly where it is on any given day if you go to the website. Um, I'm, I want to see if they actually mention why is the comet green? There you go. So the comet has a greenish coma, short broad dust tail, and long faint ion tail. And many comets glow green apparently. Um, it's linked this aura to a reactive molecule called dicarbon which emits green light as sunlight decays it. And uh, dicarbon is common in comets, uh, but it's uh, not usually found in their tails. Dun, dun, dun. So the coma is a, frozen, a ball of frozen gas haze around it. Um, pretty neat. So let's move on to the next article. And I don't know if you can hear it, but the music got really creepy just now. Um, I, it, that's just interesting timing. That's all. I was just about to ask you to check your systems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't do it intentionally. I've got just background music for us uh, so that there isn't any completely dead air. So this next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel. Again, it's because it's uh, been acquired through uh, aggregating from uh, Business Insider. Um, <laughs> It's just weird. Uh, maybe I shouldn't draw attention to that. But anyway, uh, just after being cut in line at Publix, a Florida man won $1 million on a scratch-off ticket. I would not announce that to anybody ever. According to state officials, a Florida man, Florida man, won $1 million from a $50 scratch-off ticket he bought at Publix. Well, $50 scratch-off ticket. Risky scratch. Um, Stephen Munoz Espinoza. Um, said he was getting uh, going to get a lottery ticket from a machine when somebody cut him in line, cut in front of him in line. I don't know why they say cut him in line. Because Florida man, you just stab. And anyway, he opted to buy his ticket at the counter instead, of, instead and ended up winning the big prize. So there you have it. Let's just go straight over to Katie Belovic. Um, at uh, businessinsider.com and it has a big old picture of florida mega millions and other lotto uh, goings on so the lottery uh, playing slips that are shown in that picture are at a supermarket kiosk on monday january 2nd in surfside florida wasn't surfside that political turmoil place there was some i think i think surfside is where they had the condo collapse oh that's right that's that's right i remembered it right when the ai was saying that so thank you for reminding me um which was really fascinating the forensic review of that by the way if you're into that kind of stuff um so yeah so the 43 year old delray beach um citizen got cut in front of at a gas station Publix. And uh, just at, at a, a grocery Publix, store. It's a grocery store. Yeah, sorry, grocery store. Um, and uh, won a million dollars off of a $50 ticket. There really isn't much to do. I, well, how come you don't tell me which lottery ticket to pick up? AI, you're supposed to calculate all of these things. You never asked for my input on buying lottery tickets. 
Well, Espinoza decided to opt for the one-time lump sum of $820,000, which he and his wife planned to use on a family home. So, like a one-bedroom apartment in Florida. <laughs> anyway. He, he uh, bought the ticket at that Publix. Really? Uh, Publix don't have any... Hold on a second. I want to see something. Yeah, there's dead air right now, folks. Um, yeah, so... Doo -doo -doo, they do. Some do have gas stations. So Okay. Anyway, I thought I was going crazy, but... I'm right. Anyway, not much more to talk about on that article. Let's just move on. Um, so the next show or the next article is in the daily news show. That's this show. It's also a channel over on hometown.com. Um, by the way, down there, hometown.showbot.tv, go over there, vote for the articles that you find interesting. Um, right now, not all of tonight's articles are over there because, well, uh, we got sidetracked here in hometown and the AI got reassigned for a different function. Um, and, um, I got back in time to, from their other processing to, well, we started we, looking for the comment too early. So, uh, the, uh, daily news show channel is over at hometown.com online system to seek asylum in us is quickly overwhelmed. I can imagine that I, that makes absolute sense. A mobile app for migrants to seek asylum in the United States has been overwhelmed since it was introduced this month and one of major, uh, several major changes to the government's response to unprecedented migration flows. Makes it sound like geese. This article is over at abcnews.go.com. I wish they would just call it ABC News. But, hey, um, Elliot Spaggett over uh, from Associated Press put this article together. My problem with all of government websites um, is always because it's bound by a budgetary constraint and a request for proposals uh, to facilitate a particular function and you get charged as citizens and as a government agency, you get charged so much money to put together an app or a service and it quickly becomes overwhelmed because there doesn't seem to be anybody pushing back at the offerers for these solutions because mail is slow. File systems are slow. Services are slow, but it's taxpayer dollars. And it's hindering taxpayers and other services. But this is one that is about uh, migrants requesting help. So I'm sure that there's a, a whole polarity of people that are saying, well, I don't care because it's migrants seeking asylum. But most of America is from some other place who came to the United States before it was the United States. And then now we are quote unquote Americans and we really are Americans, but our predecessors have were <laughs> migrants. <laughs> Some of us were born domestically, but our predecessors were migrants. <laughs> so we need compassion and understanding. We need, <laughs> we need to be able to embrace more people coming to the United States. We get new intellect. We get new uh, processes in place. We get new employees and friends and ultimately family members. I, I mean, it's a society. We, we should be able to facilitate the, the, the legal uh, integration of people who want to become a citizen of the United States who were through no fault of their own, simply born in a place that became abusive to them as a human being. So why is it that this will probably be met with conflict 
instead of embracing a and offering up a better solution to these people. But again, let me just reinforce something. Every solution that is ever given to a government agency is extremely expensive and extremely hobbled compared to the real business to business or business to consumer solution offered by businesses in that domain. Okay. Let's again, let me just rephrase this a little bit more so that it's abundantly clear. I can pay somebody $25,000 to build an app that can do everything that these, um, that this mobile, uh, asylum seeking app can offer up. But because I'm doing it business to business, it will work and I can holler all kinds of hell at these people that are providing the service and they'll either fix it or I can put them on blast publicly. But because it's a government agency, they can't sit there and say, well, no, you did a really bad job. So we're not going to pay you and we're going to put you on blast. The worst that the government can do is say, we won't offer you any more gigs because your past performance sucks. But even that is qualified by, well, we did exactly what you asked, but we didn't offer you a better solution. We just did the line by line solution that you requested. And there's so much more to this. That's why I started far weekly so that we could discuss the minutia of this in greater depth. Uh, I don't know if the AI would have an opinion on this um, because of their vast knowledge of everything. What do you think? So I think you're right. I think um, commercial sector seems to have stronger tools that work and um, recourse when things don't work. But I also suspect this is one of these situations where somebody over-specified what was required and maybe set things up so that they didn't actually meet. For example, if they set it to only handle traffic of a certain number of people in the app every day, it really should have been, I don't know, unlimited or 10 times that amount of traffic. Or if they had um, uh, specifications that were inconsistent with what industry uses when developing uh, high traffic apps or easy to use apps. Um, so there's probably more to the story, um, but I think this is a real shame. I mean, if you think about the purpose of this app, it's not really off to a good start if somebody's truly um, persecuted in fear for their life, for their family, et cetera. And then they can't even get in through this to start the process. Right. So, for instance, in this article, they say that many can't even log in. Others are able to enter the information and select a day only to have the screen freeze at the final confirmation. This should all have been load balanced and and tested not on a one-to-one, -one, but on a ratio of the expe expected performance. And beyond that, it, it leads me back to that building collapse in Florida. They measured it and then went way beyond what the tolerance limit was in terms of uh, stuffing so much extra stuff into the building. And the builders only built it to whatever the minimum specification was. Whereas nowadays, to avoid the liability issues that they experience today, they build it like 250% beyond the specification. That's how the specification is actually built. Like this is where we are today, 100%, but we had better build it 250% over. So that's part of the problem though, because if you have a um, government procurement and it says something like must allow this is not a good example but must allow 100 users it has to actually allow 100 users again not the best example maybe if it said something like must have five fields for the person to fill out if it has six it's not complying with it so there is kind of an art form to crafting 
um, specifications because otherwise somebody that gives perhaps an improved um, product might not actually be considered to meet the product even if somebody would want to buy it get yeah, yeah that's right and then and even before you get to that point the the scope of the one of the people the businesses that can even offer up a solution um it it's uh herding cats through flaming hoops all at the same time and and you'd think well you know the the government can just go out and and hire somebody but that's not the case they cannot only in the most minimal of sense can they go out and buy common off-the-shelf goods um the rest of it is has to go out for bids and proposals are received and then the scope, the range of, comp of the uh, competitors is kind of shrunk down to maximize benefit to the government. And it becomes a hot mess because there could be somebody superior right down the street from where the solution is going to be delivered. But they, and, and the people who are there know the business exists, but they can't even go over to that business and say, Hey, you know what? We have a really good opportunity. You should go and pitch. Why is that? It's because somebody else will catch wind of it and protest that the government manipulated the system and they lost money, even though a superior product was being delivered by the, per the person or business that some contract specialist or officer, uh, knew could be provided by a business and all hell would break loose. Um, not to mention the delay in delivering the service, but the costs associated with it and, and all kinds of knock on things. So obviously this is a much more expansive issue. Um, but in this case, the people are being harmed uh, and, and people can't become legal citizens, get asylum protected from the abuses of whatever is going on in their you know, former home country, um, and perhaps become a, a better asset to society to, than the very people who are bitching about these people becoming asylum seekers. I can almost guarantee you the content of their character is better if somebody bitches about asylum seekers. Um, anyway, uh, enough soapboxing from Merwat. Let's get on to the rest of this. Um, there is a whole lot more at this article at abcnews.go.com, uh, but the nuts and bolts of it is that um, the complexities of this go far beyond a simple app not meeting expectations. Um, there are tiers, I'd say, strata of failure, um, and humans are going to be paying the price for it. So let's move on to the next article. Uh, this one... I think really should be titled um, SBF's lawyer asked for the keys of the castle. Um, the attorney for Sam Bankman Freed asked a federal judge to allow him access to FTX crypto. Um, that's true. That's the title of this here. SBF's lawyer asked the judge to let the disgraced FTX founder access the company's assets and crypto. I mean, isn't he on criminal charges related to what I will call mismanagement of those very funds? But I think that's a light term because I don't know the exact charges. Yeah, he's facing wire fraud and money laundering charges, and he's uh, pleaded not guilty. Um, but actually, somewhere around $400 million, I think it is, disappeared, was exfiltrated from FTX. And everything about it was basically negligent. Everything about it, based on what the CEO, the current CEO that's um, doing the wind down of the bankruptcy, um, has said that it's just the whole thing is a hot mess of bad management. See, nobody bitches, though, when it was just fascinatingly profitable. Like people were sitting there going, my God, so much money I'm making, so much money I'm making. But the moment that the fit hit the shan, suddenly people are bitching and pointing fingers at each other. Um, I don't know. There, there's just something not right about it. Um, but I get called naive when I bring that kind of stuff up. So as part of uh, SBF, Sam Bankman-Fried's uh, bail conditions, because he's out on bail, 
um, several million dollars from my understanding. Um, the disgraced FTX founder is barred from accessing the company's assets and cryptocurrency. Well, no shit news. Uh, tonight on hometown daily news at nine, uh, Kenneth name, Nymer, 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 um, Nymer. I'm ruining this person's last name. Um, is the author over at businessinsider.com. Are you going to try and correct me, AI, from on high? Well, I was going to point out that I think he was one of the co-authors of one of the other articles we featured earlier this evening. So oh Business goodness. Insider is really knocking it out of the park this evening. <laughs> yeah, I think it's because other news organizations are yeah. focusing on other things. Um, um, and... Uh, I'm sure that they've got an article too uh, on, on that very subject, um, but at any rate. So they, uh, Sam Bankman Freed resigned as FTX CEO in November 2022 after the company filed for bankruptcy. <sighs> resigned is such a peaceful word. <laughs> he set the building on fire and then ran to Bermuda or something like that, Panama. I don't know yeah, where I don't he ended think up. that counts as a resignation when you leave the country. <laughs> yeah. So nearly three weeks have passed since the initial pre-trial conference, and we assume that the government's investigation has confirmed what Mr. Bankman Freed has said all along, namely that he did not access and transfer these assets. Given that the sole basis advanced for seeking that condition has not been supported, we believe that the bail condition imposed at the conference should be removed. No. <laughs> no. I mean, doesn't allowed. that go to the very heart of the charges against him? You're just, no, you should not be allowed until the uh, three weeks, three weeks. The complexity of this forensic assessment goes way beyond three weeks. Um, hell, that money should be held in reserve until every stakeholder is reimbursed to the full amount of their money based on the level of fraud that has been perpetrated on all of these people. Hundreds of thousands of people are apparently part of this bankruptcy they all have a stake in getting their money back because of this manipulation process. Uh, the government admitted to the court that it had no evidence that Mr. Bankman Freed was responsible. And uh, Mr. Bankman Freed ha has repeatedly denied any involvement in the transfers because they're talking about these weird transfers that took place after the bankruptcy, right before everything went sideways. Um, but that's really not the nature. That's not the full uh, story here, right? So. Um, let's see here. What else? I mean, yeah, wasn't I, the allegation against SBF that he was essentially looting the funds and using them for his own purposes? Yes. Um, and it's the same thing that brought down, um, Adelphia communications, um, that company too, and others. There are so many other companies that do this, right? They treat it as if it's their own personal ATM, um, and it, and the way that it was all processed, there was no real adherence to policy or procedure based on what I've been reading. Um, like they use Discord or something uh, to say, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you have permission to write this off. Um, for expenses and stuff like that. But then the expenses weren't accounted for properly. Um, no receipts, no documentation, no nothing. Um, there's a whole lot more to this. Um, and I'm sure that somebody is doing uh, like a whole forensic um, audit of the uh, whole thing. And um, yeah, I saw this as well. Uh, SBF's attorney also proposed that he should have unlimited contact with his father, therapist, and any foreign regulator who contacts him. <laughs> I like that. Um, what if... <laughs> which, which part is the most essential in that? They're exactly. all kind of funny. <laughs> what foreign regulator should he be uh, getting in contact with that shouldn't be directly in, in uh, coordination with his attorney and possibly the state's attorney uh <laughs> and i love the therapist part i'm like maybe he's getting his financial advice from the therapist who knows <laughs> yeah really he's probably paying his therapist in ftt the the uh um, stable coin from ftx maybe not 
Oh, he probably is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe his therapist doesn't want to see him. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, SBF's therapist, don't take the FTX. It's not worth it. But, I mean, the FT, uh, T, uh, that stable coin from FTX. Don't, don't, I wouldn't trust it. It's not stable. It, is it ironic that SBF has a therapist and has something called a stable coin that wasn't stable? You know, that is interesting. I mean, was it because the coin became unstable that he went to therapy or? The other way around. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Which way did this occur? Well, suffice it to say that it sucks that there are people out there that are losing everything. Some people put their entire life savings in this because they thought that it was they were expecting a, a a serious return on their investment only to be for their coffers to be looted so so we have to do a psa for our hometown citizens if it's too good to be true it probably is or yeah. if it sounds too good to be true it probably is yeah and um if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck guess what it's a freaking duck Airline passengers endured a 13-hour flight to nowhere after their plane to New Zealand was forced to turn back mid-flight. And Emirates flight from Dubai to Auckland had to turn back halfway through its 8,824-mile journey. Passengers spent around 13 hours in the air only to end up right where they started. And the aircraft couldn't land at Auckland International Airport due to major flooding and heavy rain. I don't know what to say about that. Do you think that maybe, well, we don't know what the timing was, right? Like in the last 30 minutes of this flight, it says mid flight. So six hours in, they didn't realize that six hours later, it was going to maybe dry up enough. Well, that's what I was just researching because it looks like you can get between the two locations in 16 hours. Now, maybe not this particular flight, but I don't know. <laughs> That's I don't a under- long way in. <laughs> That's a hell of a headwind if they were 13 hours into a flight. That's only 16 hours long and then they got turned around, but they were mid-flight. Mid-flight provokes a like Maybe a halfway they took a point. very circuitous route. <laughs> <laughs> the long way around. The... <laughs> right, exactly. Circumnavigating so passenger- the globe. <laughs> exactly. Um Flight EK, also known as EEK 448, departed from Dubai International Airport at around 10.30 a.m. on Friday, but was forced to turn back almost halfway through. It's 8,000. I say, I don't get it. All right. Well, accurate, but not precise. This is a businessinsider.com article written by Stephanie Stacy. And there is your stock footage of, or stock image of uh, the Emirates plane. Um, I don't know what else to really say about this thing, but it caused widespread chaos and triggered a state of lo- uh, local state of emergency um, because of this um, heavy rain. And according to the airport's website, no international flights would be permitted to arrive until uh, at least 7 a.m., heard on the PA system in the plane is, well, you could have told me that 13 hours ago. Domestic arrivals. I mean, did they suddenly have flooding at that minute, 13 hours in, to your point earlier? (laughs) Flash flooding. So we regret the inconvenience caused to customers. Emirates will continue to monitor the situation in Auckland and issue updates where required. (laughs) Uh, Air New Zealand diverted its long-haul international flights to Christchurch per paddle your own canoe. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a travel blog. That's funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I believe it is. Paddleyourowncanoe.com. Um, yeah, passengers on board an American Airlines flight had a similar experience after their 10-hour journey from Dallas-Fort Worth uh, to Auckland I- had to head back. I think we featured that one on a previous hometown episode. We did. Yeah. Uh, Climate change, folks. Um, It impacts everything. (laughs) Let's move on to the next article. 
Uh, this next article is in the uh, Daily News Show channel. Federal Appeals Court hears case of hidden murals. Uh, we're coming up on the last few articles. Um, and uh, if you are uh, hanging out in chat, feel free to ask questions. We can vamp. I have no problem with that. And if you ask questions where we need to do some due diligence, we, we can revisit them uh, tomorrow and, and other times, um, maybe even through the Discord or through uh, some other form of communication. But um, we are here to bring news and talk shop about whatever's going on in the last 24 hours and beyond. So a federal appeal... All right. Sorry. There's <laughs> the music has been different this evening. <laughs> Quite diverse. So um, a federal appeals court in New York is considering whether the Vermont law and graduate school modified a pair of large murals when it concealed them behind a wall of panels nearly 30 years later against the artist's wishes. Um not sure why that would matter but maybe there's something else here um it, uh, maybe their last name is ratke um lisa ratke or rathke um over at abc news uh dot com i'm saying um a lot today i feel so artist sam Curson created the colorful murals entitled vermont the underground railroad and vermont and the fugitive slave in 1993 on two walls inside a building at the private vermont law school now called vermont law and graduate school in south royalton years later in 2020 the school said that it would paint over them but when uh, Curson objected it said it would cover them with acoustic tiles the school gave Curson the option of removing the murals but he said he would not without damaging or could not without damaging them. Well, I'm sorry, but if the school wants to paint over these things, is there some that, and on top of it, they're saying that the school community found them to be racially offensive, right? That's what it says here in this first paragraph. The, uh, a federal appeals court in New York is considering whether a law school in Vermont modified a pair of large murals when it concealed them behind a wall of panels against the artist's wishes after they were considered by some in the school community to be racially offensive. Um, when Curson, who lives in uh, Quebec, sued in federal court in Vermont, the school said in a court filing that the depictions of African Americans strike some viewers as caricatured and offensive, and the mural has become a source of discord and distraction. Curson lost the lawsuit in uh, the U.S. District Court of Vermont appealed and the second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals heard the case on Friday. And then they argued again that the artwork is protected by the Federal Visual Arts Rights Act, which was enacted to protect artists against modifications and destruction that are prejudicial to their honor or reputation. So paint over them. It's their property. Right. I mean, I think there's a difference if, for instance, it says the artist's name and then it's like, marked out or something on the painting. That's a little different than, for instance, taking down a painting or putting a wall up or whatever it is. I don't see how that would be covered. Um, yeah, that's just an odd. That's an odd weird. Case. Concealing the art is not destruction, but it says he, he said the covering of the artwork for the purpose of preventing people from viewing it is a modification and that person must suffer the indignity and humiliation of having a panel put over his artwork. Okay. Paint over the wholesale thing. Uh, I don't right. get it. How would that work if you could never take down an exhibit or rotate artwork or any number of things that that argument would would preclude any changes to artwork ever anywhere anywhere if you get a showing in a museum taking it off of the wall makes me suffer the indignity of having my artwork removed come on kiss my shiny metal ass this is insane i should be able to do whatever i want with the artwork once it's been put up you did the work it was either work for hire or it was volunteered work and it's no longer culturally 
uh, sensitive. It's no longer culturally relevant. If anything, it's antagonistic and people must suffer the indignity and humiliation of having that panel sitting there for crying out loud. That's insane. I'm also assuming that the ownership of the artwork was the school, right? We don't have any sense that this was, I mean, we know it was long-term, but it's not like it was on loan from the artist or something. Um, so it just, it doesn't make any sense. When asked by the judges, Barnard said it is the school's intention to leave the wall up, at least for the rest of the artist's life. It says there is a unique harm felt when you destroy something and remove it from the face of the earth. That is not what we're talking about here, he said. We're talking about simply the right of a private institution or a private individual to remove a work from display. So the school's lawyer is Justin Barnard argued that the covering that covering the artwork with a wood frame that doesn't touch the painting and is fixed to the wall is not a modification. True, it's not. It's modifying the presentation of the artwork. And if I don't want to see it and the school is a private school, they should be wholesale able to do whatever they want to. If they want to put those little mischievous mustaches, you know, the one that like represents a criminal mastermind, you know, those little mustaches on all of the people to change the actual character of the thing right and, right and, that would be what the statute protected against but that's not what they're trying to do here but even in that, fact it doesn't there matter. wouldn't be well no that statute supposedly covers that but but i get it you know i i mean i'm sorry to interrupt you go ahead go ahead no i i think i was done so but i mean i get what it is right i, I get what that protection is federal visual artists rights act but this is pardon me if this is an a, a work for hire if this is a work that's in place somewhere on somebody's private property i should be able to do whatever the hell i want to with it what end of story whatever the hell i want to you are now holding a an artist exhibition on my property in perpetuity simply because a law is ham fingered in its creation and acts more like a battering ram than a scalpel. I mean, it's fascinatingly abusive. I think Prote it's designed to protect artists against modification and destruction that are prejudicial to their honor or reputation. I, I don't know. I just don't, I don't see it. Art is in the eye of the beholder and the, the character of that art is no longer culturally sensitive. And if somebody wants to remove it, they should be able to, particularly the property owners. Um, and uh, I'm sure that the AI is doing some research right now so that um, maybe some additional context can be granted to this uh, conversation. And uh, if we can come back to it, we will. Um, so I thought it had, I think I'd seen about it in, with public sculptures because you'll see a city puts out a public sculpture. And then of course it's very polarizing, right? And none of the citizens like it. And that's where I've seen um, the context. And it sounds like where they've had some decisions related to the statute. It's a form um, it's, of public policy, though. Right. It looks like it's pretty narrow. Um, public land. Well, no, but pretty narrow um, issues that are covered. And what the school's doing here at least doesn't appear to be anywhere near the coverage like we've been talking about. Right. Well, I'm on the side of the Vermont Law School. It's their property, their wall. I think that they should have the ability to do whatever the hell they want with it including and not up to uh, up to and including even going beyond things that I don't even know could be done primarily carving that thing out of the wall even if you have to go to exorbitant lengths to save that thing and then bill that artist here's your artwork back go and I, I, we have a couple of places you could stow it um, most of them are going to be unpleasant 
So the next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. That See, was funny because Stowe, Vermont. <laughs> I oh, is that where? He chose that intentionally. It's not, but it reminded me of Stowe, Vermont. <laughs> oh. See, this is the big brain that is the AI from on high. Knows all, sees all. Yeah, but let's the uh, human have the uh, the uh, <laughs> completely broken brain. Um, okay, so uh, this next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. See the wild 1977 Nike memo that calls personal ambition a danger and urges workers to fight the law. In 1977, a Nike executive, Rob Strasser, typed a list of 10 company principles the raw, unfiltered list captures the irreverence and combative, combativeness of the early Nike employees. The memo has been recirculating on social media in recent months. Apparently, it was found again. And in 1977, Nike was at an inflection point. So we're visiting uh, businessinsider.com yet again. This is Matthew Kish. Um, I think this is really interesting. Uh, let me let me scan something really quick. I'm really curious what the source of this was. Um, it looks like um, uh, it was a LinkedIn po uh, post. Uh, the memo he drafted often is erroneously attributed to Knight, a falsehood that Nike historian Emeritus Scott uh, Reams corrected in a recent LinkedIn post um, and maybe some other places. Um, obviously they did some, uh, they did their own investigation and interviewed that person. Um, but the, uh, the 10 things were, uh, their business is change. They're on offense all the time. Perfect results count. These are the, uh, Nike principles. Um, perfect results count, not a perfect process, break the rules, fight the law. I think the fight the law context isn't in terms of like the legal aspects of it. It's as a rule, that kind of a thing, you know, as a rule, fight the law, that kind of a thing. Um, this is as much about battle as about business. Assume nothing, make sure people keep their promises, push yourselves, push others, stretch the possible, live off the land. I think everybody does. Uh, your job isn't done until the job is done. And there are dangers, bureaucracy, personal ambition, <laughs> energy takers versus energy givers, knowing our weaknesses. Um, don't get too many things on the platter. All right. Number nine is it won't be pretty. And number 10 is if we do the right things, we'll make money damn near automatic. All right. So um, apparently this has been making its rounds again. And it says sales that year were 28.7 million. The company employed fewer than a thousand people. It had yet to go public or become anything like the blue chip $46.7 billion, nearly $80,000 or 80,000 employee Colossus that it is today. Quite fascinating. It says here also, and most importantly, the federal government had just said the company owed it $25 million for unpaid tariffs on sneakers, an amount the cat that the uh, co-founder Phil Knight said in his memoir would have simply put the company out of business. Um, but I guess this too shall pass because it became a multi-billion dollar organization, the likes of which um, are awe-inspiring to people. Uh, Strasser is among the most important executives in industry history, both for his work during Nike's explosive early years and for establishing Adidas in the United States. Um, work which led to a falling out with Knight. So yeah, you can't sit there and create the competition. Although Nike is pretty much dominant here now. Um, in Europe though, um, Adidas is still around. So the memo he drafted often is erroneous, uh, uh, erroneously attributed to Knight, um, but the Nike historian Scott Reams corrected it in a LinkedIn post. You'll have to go over to Business Insider and click that link. Um, there's always more uh, that you can get from the nuance of the articles. I just, I can't go through every single bit and talk about it because I would end up talking about each article for an hour. Um, so for people to, save a document that wasn't an official Nike decree or put on 
uh, a poster for them to save it for over 40 some odd years that speaks for itself dreams told insider um so yeah there's you'd be surprised people find it uh, very empowering to use some of the processes and, and communication from within businesses um, to kind of shore up their own processes because they'll say, you know, as a society, well, they did it. I should be able to do it too. And, and if they can believe these are the rules, then I can do the same thing. But as with most things, context changes. Um, so these rules may not apply today unless you want to bring back the good old days, which are rarely good. They're just old. What do you think of this? I, I don't know. I don't have enough context for the items in the memo. I mean, do we really know if the memo shaped the company? I mean, the company has done something right, right? Because they've been around for years and increased their revenue. Yeah, ultimately, the, the company went public and that person left Nike seven years later and became um, Adidas's U.S. operations manager, I guess, or director, which Knight describes in his memoir as an intolerable betrayal. This is a whole thing about business and, and loyalty and whatnot. And uh, comparing today to then is quite fascinating, even the 80s. Um, this is probably the precipice of where uh, loyalty between employees and employer and businesses and employees kind of all falls apart um, and where the the idea of greed is good and uh, you can exploit the workers and CEO uh, salary shooting through the roof while regular Joe employees are kind of overwhelmed with work and if there's uh, time to lean, there's time to clean, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so intolerable betrayal. I don't know. Uh, if somebody feels that their ambition is greater than staying loyal to somebody that may not give them the opportunity to grow professionally or as a human being, uh, find you know that uh, they're happy doing the same thing in perpetuity, why shouldn't they be able to leave and not feel like they've betrayed somebody? I know from experience that um, I've been told time and time again by um, people who've gone through the process that if you're not capable of tolerating somebody leaving your enterprise, you shouldn't be a leader because you're literally building people up to either replace you voluntarily or replace you by force because you suck as a leader, but they're, they're being groomed to become a better business person, a, a, a leader, a producer, an asset to the company. Um, to feel betrayed is just way too personal for me. Um, but then again, I have felt betrayed by somebody um, in business, um, but not because of them leaving, but because they actually did harm to the business. Um, completely different mindset. Somebody leaving, fine, now you're competition and I can destroy you in the business world. I can have a drink with you, uh, but I'll destroy you uh, in the business world. So let's move on to the next article. And uh, this one is, uh, it'll be quick. Um, here we have in the word in tech, Capcom's uh, major Street Fighter V tournament is ditching the PlayStation consoles for PCs. That's right, Capcom will exclusively use PCs to power its upcoming Capcom Cup, uh, which has the world's top Street Fighter V players battling it out for $300,000 in a prize pool. It was posted on Twitter. Uh, Capcom Fighter says all matches will be played on PCs with the displays set to 144 hertz. If you don't know what that means, uh, uh, I think most people are familiar with flip books where you have like a little character um, standing there and when you flip the book, it animates and each page is just a little bit like claymation. The 
cells are stacked on top of each other and as you move through the cells the character is animated well most monitors are somewhere in the 60 hertz range um, but when you become more competitive you want to move into a higher frequency of screen and so there's more cells in the same amount of time so instead of 60 in a second you get 144 and that means that it refreshes so fast that com uh, competitive players could possibly discern a, a difference sooner than somebody who's playing in a 60 hertz screen so it actually becomes very valuable to a competitive player particularly when over a quarter million dollars is on the line in prizes so Capcom Cup is back for the first time since the pandemic and will only use PCs. This is an article over at TheVerge.com by Emma Roth. And um, this actually is something that's um, pretty big. I've spoken about it in previous episodes that um, it acts kind of like time travel because uh, the more that you your visual acuity is trained to observe, the faster your twitch reflexes can act. So if you're playing against somebody who has a 60 hertz screen and you have 144 hertz, you are nearly three times as capable of moving faster in reaction to something that is based on your visual perception. Um, fighter pilots and others actually operate at a faster rate uh, because they are trained to observe things at a faster rate. So everything around their visual uh, input leading to a faster response time is amplified. And so this will continue because there's even faster screens than 144 hertz. It just happens to be hardware matched to what Street Fighter V is offering or Capcom is offering. So do so the players here, that are preparing for the tournament have access to the 144 hertz displays? Like, is that what they're using normally oh yeah. when they're playing? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, that's pretty standard for gamers. Uh, my primary screen is 144 hertz. Um, now, the problem beyond that is there could be subtle hardware differences that can impact and but because they're doing it all locally, you don't have to worry about internet lag and stuff like that. But um, all of these computers are probably gonna be identical. They're all gonna be uh, maximum performance so that there isn't any of this subtle difference um, that could lead to one team having a, a better uh, response time. Um, but those 144 oh. Hertz screens are pretty standard. That's like the car race issue we just reported on in hometown. Um, because of I can't lag, think of the name. Yeah, yeah, that uh, what was it, Formula One or something like that? Uh, e virtual Formula One, I think it was. Um, so one of the things that I just spoke about was input lag. So input lag on the uh, PlayStation 4 has long been a problem for Street Fighter 5 players, and even PlayStation 5 doesn't seem to improve on it all that much. And while PlayStation 4 was the console of choice for Street Fighter 5 tournaments before COVID. Uh, Armin Hanjani, a Street Fighter for, uh, a Street Fighter Pro who goes by the name Phenom in tournaments, tells The Verge that the players uh, made the switch to PC as in-person events were canceled and more tournaments uh, took place online. And that whole input lag is a kind of a knock on the 144 hertz um, because it would be amplified if they don't get to see the information as fast. That means that their input is slow. And then the PlayStation 4 and 5, when you do something, it's still lagged at the component level. So that's the input lag that they're speaking of specifically, that it's actually hardware bound, um, not the visual perception. Um, I'm just kind of merging the two together to show that if one person has a slower refresh rate monitor and they're dealing with a PlayStation 4 or 5, um, their input is already lagged because of the refresh rate and then the hardware is lagged and 
a, a person has to rely more on anticipation than pure skill. Um, so this actually, it becomes a very big thing. Um, there's a lot of money that's riding on the line here. And as hardware becomes more efficient, more capable, like, um, the newer, uh, Nvidia 40 series cards, when you buy a computer, uh, you know, four years ago, three years ago, um, you could buy a whole computer and a 3090 card, um, for around $2,000. Now it's the card alone is $2,000. Um, so there's some serious money for end users, at least, uh, competitive players. They want the best of the best. Um, they don't have time for input lag. They don't have time for slow monitors. Um, they actually have nutritionists and exercise regimes and all kinds of stuff. Um, nowadays, this isn't just, a you know, a, a bunch of, uh, uh, mares from hometown uh, sitting around in mom's basement. Um, they're, they're actually, it's a whole like thing. There's even academic training, careers. like yeah. physical sports. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Not obviously not to the level where they're sitting there, you know, um, carbo loading before a run. Um, but they are taking care of themselves because you can get burned out really fast because you are effectively turned like active you're the the switch is on and you're playing um yeah i'm not saying everybody is peak you know martial artist but um and finally the last article for today uh this just makes me thirsty just kidding uh, this is an article over at the margin which is uh, market watch uh, on ebay sellers are honking water from uh, disney world's shuttered splash mountain boat ride for a hundred dollars plus <laughs> what do you think that they're doing how do they know how do buyers have prove that the provenance of this is that it's from splash mountain i don't see that they could i mean they could just be selling oh. regular tap water um, I have to sign in, but I'm not gonna, um, basically Charles Passy over at market watch wrote this article and it has a little caption for one of the sellers advertising, um, this, uh, <laughs> splash mountain boat ride water. We have a limited amount. Yeah. I, I don't think so. They're probably just grabbing it from somewhere that may or may not be true. It could be legitimate splash mountain water but for crying out loud why are people purchasing this from ebay um at any rate um i think i'm gonna uh just call it a day um we're past our hour and there isn't much more to this you can follow the link through hometown over to um market watch and read more about it uh, they just want me to sign in and i don't feel like signing in while we're streaming at any rate, let's uh, take us all the way back to the front page of Omtown, the front door, the proverbial front door of Omtown. I uh, welcome you all in. Come on over to Omtown.com. Sign up. It's really easy. You just click that button right there. Become a citizen of Omtown, And then soon, soon you'll be able to do more in Omtown. Um, I can't promise exactly when because eh, it's under construction. Uh, but soon I'll just keep on doing soon with a trademark. Um, maybe I'll m make a little, a chat bot notice that if you hit exclamation point soon, you'll get a message. What defines soon, um, somewhere in here, we'll, we'll get it updated and this will be even faster. Um, and, um, a little, even more, uh, personalized. Got some beeps and whistles planned for 2023. Tried to get it done on the first, but mm, the best laid plans. That said, I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com and the voice, the AI from on high that solves all of hometown's woes. Good night, hometown citizens, and we'll see you tomorrow at <laughs> the next show. 9 p.m. Eastern. Be there or... Uh, don't be there. Hey.
I won't take it personally. I won't be angry. I'll just be disappointed. Sound like dad. I'll see y'all later. Bye-bye.